I wanted to welcome you all to the MAG Silver Annual Luncheon and Presentation and Update. My name is Michael Kerluck. I'm the Vice President of Investor Relations. We've got an exciting day today uh, where we'll be, uh, of course, talking about Juan Scipio and then moving on to Deer Trail and Larder. So we'll go through all of our assets and the company in its present state. And uh, we all, as I said earlier, uh, welcome you here and thank you for coming. So without any further ado, I'll put you on to my CEO, George Paspalis. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, every afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. I know it's a busy schedule, and uh, we appreciate your time commitment to uh, MAG. Uh, I think you know most of our people. We have a new addition to the MAG family, uh, Tom Perigodorf. Tom's a new independent director. I've worked with Tom before on a board. He's a legend. I can't speak high enough about him, highly enough about him. Geologist, explorationist, but also public company CEO. So massive addition to the board. And Tom, thank you for joining us, because I know you're a man in demand, but you made the right decision. Um, we've got Lex Lambeck over here. He's the guy running Larder, and he's soon to be into a bigger exploration role within MAG, forward-looking statement. Jim Mallory, our Chief Sustainability Officer. Nathan Tribble, the guy at Larder, VP of Exploration Larder. Doing great stuff out there, Nate. Tom Eckert, he's our man in Havana, our um, government affairs person in Mexico. Mark Turcott's here, our corporate development guy over there. Uh, save the money to last, Fausto, our uh, CFO. Very fortunate to have Fausto with us. And everyone knows Peter McGaw. He's going to give you the um, upwelling theory here, which would be great. You know the drill. Forward-looking statements, MAG has a history of turning forward-looking statements into facts, but we have to tell you about forward-looking statements. MAG, you, look, everyone's pretty familiar with the company. You know we're underpinned by one of the CPO, two exploration assets. We're really well positioned now for uh, continued shareholder uh, value creation. And you know, our focus remains on advancing high-grade, long-life, Location, location, location type assets. Organic growth is our main driver. At our three assets, balance sheet's awesome. $59 million of cash at the end of Q3. All right, we repatriated $11.3 million of cash back from Juan Scipio to Vancouver. Got $25 million of cash at the joint venture level. $55 million in concentrate receivables. As Fausto's taught me, all the working capital holes are full. I think I know what that means. Uh, so we're in a great position now to just harvest pre-cash flow from one Scipio. We have a $40 million revolving credit facility undrawn. It's sort of an emergency use only facility. We don't believe we will use that. Uh, but if we do, it's there. It just gives us a more grown up balance sheet to have access to a revolver. So we're building a high margin, sustainable, long life, cash flowing business. Mag Silver's, um, one of Scipio's a tier one asset, no doubt about that. We're starting to see the cash come from that. It's located in the most preeminent silver district in the world. We're fortunate to have Fresneo PLC as the operator who have been operating in this area for over 140 years. And we get some synergies, particularly when our plant wasn't running for a year. But there are a number of synergies that partnering with Fresneo offer us. And we have a relationship now where we're working together very closely and we're realising some of the benefits of those synergies. Organic growth, discovery, is the biggest way to move the needle for value creation in our business. And we have the potential for discoveries at our three assets. Mag Silver Corp is a silver company. 
75% of our revenue comes from silver. We really like silver, and we're sure silver's going to follow gold soon. And uh, it could be exciting, 2024. If you add the gold in, we're an 85% precious metal producer. So very leveraged the precious metal prices. We've shown over the years a lot of financial discipline. A lot of our equity raise has been at 52-week highs. Our balance sheet's strong now. It's robust. And as we move forward, we're going to grow that through 2024. Here we see our shareholders. We're 70% institutionally owned. Some of them have been with us nearly from day one. Long term, very supportive of us. Um, a nice churn of retail in there at 30%. Lots of analysts in the room. There's a um, in the appendix is a list of the analysts and their target prices. But you can see here that the target price at uh, sixteen point sixteen dollars and seventeen cents. Mags on sale today. Fill back the truck up and fill it up. We've shown disciplined capital management over the years. Right as we were raising equity to fund the build of one or Scipio, right, we controlled our spend on exploration. When the government didn't hook the power up to our plan that was ready in December of 2022, we needed exploration. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Lex, for understanding the corporate, the bigger picture. Uh, so you know, we've shown that discipline and hence the balance sheet's in great shape. And our recipe's pretty simple. High margin, big production, long life one of CPO will de deliver cash flow to enable us to do our exploration in the future to reallocate cash to shareholders. But it'll give us exploration success, and that is value creation for MAG. Jim and his team have done a fantastic job on the sustainability front for us. Not just that the assets we control 100%, right? We've had a lot of influence at one Scipio as well, particularly on the safety side. And we see this rolling through year on year improvement in our sustainability ratings. I don't think sustainability is a point chasing exercise. I think it's real what you do with people on the ground. And that's very that's manifest so much at Deer Trail and Larder by the support we have from local communities. And Robert's here to back me up should anyone want to challenge me on that. So here's the three assets, one of Scipio. We made 16.8 million ounces last year, 100% basis, an average silver grade of 472 grams per tonne, and you know a pretty handy gold contrib contribution coming in there at almost 37,000 ounces of gold. So one of Scipio now is ramped up and as we move forward we get into the next stage of optimization. Lex is going to talk about deer trial. I don't want to steal your thunder but we're getting close to earning in. Uh, pretty soon this year we'll own that property 100%. There's the two guys on the picture there, Lex and Nathan up at Larder. Um, again I won't steal your thunder but I like that little baby. That sits in a great location on a train line on the Trans Canada Highway. Quebec power coming over the top. It's a wonderful place to have a discovery. So hurry up. Um, <laughs> okay, quickly down to one of Scipio. Uh, you can see the joint venture here in uh, red, surrounded by the Fresneo tenements uh, around this area of Fresneo. And as I said, we had a great year last year. Um, ramp up year, but very nice grades. Um, Nine dollars and nineteen cents, all in sustaining cash costs. Right, really good performance in a ramp up year when your project's not even optimised. It was a really successful year. Like we started up in January last year, we got to commercial production in June, name plate in the third quarter and free cash flow coming back from the operation in the third quarter. First and second quarter, we bought intercompany loan interest back to Vancouver. FASA's got that pipeline well oiled for the cash to come back now. Uh, quickly, just looking at the uh, operating performance here, the uh, 
I guess I've got a pointer here. Right? I don't want to press too many buttons. You can see, you can see here the um, ramp up in uh, mining tons. We're now at a point where the mine can feed the mill for the 4,000 ton per day nameplate at a 91% operating time. You see over here the relationship between those synergies, very important synergies of 2022 when your plan that you've built and you've sunk all that capital into doesn't start up because someone won't put the plug in to flick the switch. Single asset company, that would be a death knell. We made $120 million of operating cash flow in 2022 by virtue of processing through the Fresnillo plants. Then you can see one Ocipio, the one Ocipio plant ramping up here and we're up here at nameplate now. And every now and then you may see a quarter with a little bit going through the Sacedo plant. Should we have a major shutdown scheduled in one Ocipio? rather than take that production loss, we'll stick some stuff through their plant for a few days to offset. So it's a fantastic synergistic relationship with our partner. And you know, for years when I first started at MAG, everyone was, how's the relationship? How's the relationship? Right? Because the partners did have a bit of a spat. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie, a while ago. Um, things are a lot better now. And then you can see the silver production growing uh, this is from the Fresneo plants. Uh, this is from the Juan Ocipio plant. And, you know, moving forward, I mean, this is a, this is a uh, unique quarter where Juan Ocipio is coming up to nameplate, but we're still going full on at the two Fresneo plants. I don't think we'll replicate that quarter on quarter going forward. Right? The number's more like a plus or minus four million a quarter, but we will be releasing more fulsome guidance when we release our technical report at the end of March. Really good sustaining cash costs I've talked about. And so the focus for this year really is, okay, it's running, it's running well, we've got a great margin, now let's see what we can squeeze out of it. Let's start to look at optimising the flotation circuit and getting the recovery incrementally higher. Like everyone in the industry, let's turn ourselves to getting costs down. You know, when you have a ramp up year, all you're doing is trying to get rock from the start to the finish and make a product you can sell. Now that that's proven, let's try to do it better. Let's try and do it more efficiently. And the big initiative that we are starting together with Fresneo now, as we get into 2024 and optimization of the asset, we're going to work to try and get the mining rate up. Because if we can get that mining rate up above 4,000 tonnes per day, we think the plant, like every other plant on the planet, can do more tonnes in its nameplate. But if we can get the mining rate even above what that plant can do, we have the opportunity to put incremental material through the Fresneo plants, very accretive additional cash flow to us. So 2024 is going to be a great year for us. This is our current reserve statement from the 2017 technical report. I think everyone's familiar, Bonanza Zone, wonderful grades. Year on year, they reduce as we get deeper. And our technical report is only going to focus on the Valdecanes vein, not the Valdecanes vein system, where we have all these associated structures you can see in here, which may give us the opportunity to actually plateau a little that decline in silver grade. We're seeing strong base metals from the drilling that we've done since 2016. That's going to offset this declining silver grade as well. So the future's looking pretty good here. We've done a lot of step out and infill drilling since 2016, which was the drilling cutoff point for the 2017 report. So a forward-looking statement would be, I would expect this resource complement to grow. So we have a 19-year, plus 19-year mine life already. Um, we think that'll extend significantly. So I'll hand over to Peter now to come and talk about the geology, because there's no one better on the planet than to talk about the geology. Pedro. George. There you go, mate. I'm going to take the step this time. 
welcome. It's delightful to be here again. I don't know how many years I've been doing this, but all of them, I think. Um, so, yeah, it's a lot of fun always to talk about the exploration at Winnesipio. The story hasn't really changed since last year. Uh, we've still only explored 5% of the property. Uh, we have enormous upside potential. Uh, we understand the system much better now that we've done even more drilling and have gotten into it. Uh, we recognize that we are on top of a major ore fluid upwelling point where the fluids came up and then spread out through the Juan Escipio vein system or the Valdecanias vein system laterally off of the property. But now, as George said, the relationship with the partners is better. We have a little bit more of a regional or total understanding of how the system is working. And we recognize a lot of the structural underpinnings. We have a big structural intersection here. We have a funnel-shaped scarn, which represents how the fluids came in and spread out. We see high copper down here at depth. And boron, which isn't very exciting in terms of economics, but is very important in terms of telling us where we are with respect to that magmatic upwelling, uh, which is what feeds all of this. But this gives us a series of components that we can put together, and we can project everything we see here to the surface and look at the alteration directly along the Valdecanias vein, get a feel for what the signature of that is, and then look around for repeats within the overall system. And what we recognize is that when we compare Valdecanias right here to two other very similar upwelling zones in the historic part of the district that don't have the benefit of outcrop, which we do have at Juan Escipio, but they have the same internal Overall, increase of, grade, of base metals with depth, they go deeper, they're higher grade, they're more laterally extensive, remembering that the structural environment here was very special and very open. So instead of your normal vein widths of a half a kilometer or a few hundred meters, we have continuous mineralization in the structures in this district that run for up to eight kilometers. So the up to eight kilometer vein is actually the Valdecanias vein. So this, at this point in time, is the most important known vein in the district. But we're just starting to understand how the district works overall. And when we look around, what we recognize and recognized quite a while ago is a major long-lived intrusive and volcanic center, we have at least three additional upwelling zones. We put some holes into this year before last and last year. We recognize now that we drilled it from the back side rather than the front side, so we went over the top of it, so where we cut that structure was too high to be in the mineralized zone, so we need to drill that deeper, and we're starting to work on moving this structure and this structure or these potential upwelling zones because each of these don't represent a single additional vein. They represent the heart of an additional vein swarm. So it's not just finding one big vein, it's finding a big vein plus a series of subordinate but related veins. So as George said, our PEA, or updated resource, is going to focus on the Valdecanias vein proper, but the Valdecanias vein is just the principal vein in that swarm. So we'll be looking for additional big veins that then lead us to a series of additional ones. So it's very exciting. Um, permitting is moving slowly, because permitting is moving slowly in Mexico at the moment, and probably will for at least until June uh, when they have their election. And uh, we hope things change then. So Fresnillo is the core driver of MAG's value. Um, the district itself has produced or between production and resources, over three billion ounces of silver. That makes it bigger than Cerro Rico de Bolivia, just to give you perspective. That was historically considered the world's largest silver district. About a billion ounces of that is represented by the overall Valdecanias vein system within the claim and next to it. Uh, we Overall, this represents 10% of the world's historic silver production. Uh, so it's pretty exciting address to be there with the fact that we've only explored in this piece of it 
we have a good model to export to the rest of this property and continue exploring with cash from cash flow. So we're not going to be sending money to Mexico. We may leave a little money in Mexico to pay for that exploration, but we won't have to dig into our pocket to do that. So I don't think you could design a much better exploration scenario and strategy going forward. Um, and it's, I first set foot on this property in 1995. We hit the big drill hole in 2003. We're now fully in production. That's a lifetime or a career time for a geologist. So I'm delighted to be in the position here and on our other projects in the position where I'm comfortable that there's a handoff to be made at some point in the future um, to the younger generation of geologists who I've had the fortune of working with for anywhere from two to probably 20 years, uh, even though that doesn't make you that much younger. Um, but I'm going to turn you over to part of the next generation of MAG's geologic team, Lex Lambeck, who is running the Deer Trail Project in Utah. Those aren't cowboy boots, boots, what they sound like. <laughs> yeah, I'm not wearing my cowboy boots today. I could have. Apologize for that. Didn't think of that. <laughs> I do own a pair too. I'm quite proud of them. So I'm going to give you an update today on the Utah project. Do you want to? Okay. Is that better? I was going to roam around, but I'll stay still. Um, I'm going to give you an update on the Deer Trail project in southern central Utah. And this is a project that we've been on the ground since early 2020. Uh, sorry, 2019, actually. Um, and we've been working um, hard on it ever since. The drill has been turning there pretty much continuously since late 2020. And I want to take you through what the results are meaning so far, and especially the results from the last year, and give you an update of what we were talking about from um, last year. So let's just zoom in on ourselves. We've got Juan Escipio down here in Mexico. That's very much an epithermal system. And that's what Peter's just been talking about, world-class system. And then we move up into southern central Utah here, well, um, more southern, yeah, southern central Utah here at the Deer Trail Project. And again, I'm going to take you through how we're on world-class main CRD trends there. And that's why we're there. We've got excellent ground, and I want to take you through those results and some of the reasons to why we're there. We're chasing elephant size, mag size targets. And very much been early on in um, drilling since late 2020, started work in early 2019, and very much near the earn in 100% of this project. So for CRD deposits, you need a checklist when you go out there. This is why we got this project. This is why we're excited about it. And it's those top three that really get us interesting. In the next slide, I'm going to show you um, what location location means that George referred to. We're in a world-class area. We're in a top um, jurisdiction for mining in Utah. And I want to show you what that CRD belt means and who else is along that same CRD belt. And I'll explain how CRDs like to occur in a line. They're along a linear trend, and we'll have a look at that. And then I want to show you how with CRD belts, you need carbonate, you need limestone. If you don't have limestone, you don't have a CRD deposit. We've got lots of limestone and we've got room to grow. I'm going to show you how, with our reinterpretation and our drilling, we've found more limestone at depth and we've got plenty of room to start exploring and that's what we've been doing. And then obviously you can have all of those, but we've also got fluid. We've got juice to the system and we've got good juice to the system. We can see in the historical um, deer trail mine up high in the system, it had good grade to it, but it was basically for 150 years no one made a go of it. But we can see how everything's coming from depth. And no one, until MAG got on the ground, was able to drill to depth. And that's what we've done, and that's what we're finding, that continued mineralisation at depth. So we've got good grades at depth. So this is our location slide. We're on CRD Main Street. And by that, I mean we've got Bingham Canyon up here 
in Salt Lake City. That's one of the world's biggest copper porphyry deposits. It started out life, as I'm going to show you, as a CRD deposit. And that's what they were mining before they even got into the copper. And they are mining that for about 50 years and got, or 70 years, 50 million tonnes of um, CRD mineralisation. So it was a big deposit. And then you've got the other historical Tintic and Park City uh, mines there as well. And then Deer Trail sat down on this trend here. And it wasn't until MAG came out and started taking up this property that we're able to fit Deer Trail to this trend because it was always seen in the literature as a much younger unit. It didn't fit with the ages of the rocks. That's these numbers here. That's the age of the rock that's been done through geochronological dating. But the dates down here were done in the 1980s. And those dates were, let's just say, out of date. And there's a lot more technology now involved. And the rocks that they dated were perhaps a bit tenuous. And there was this much younger age, so no one fitted it in on this trend. They just thought it was unrelated, not part of it. But when we came out on site, when I first came out on site, when we are actually looking at the project and making that decision, I looked at that data. I've got a geochronology background. I was just like, that data looks a bit tenuous. It's old. I think we can do better than that. And sure enough, in 2019, we redated the rocks and we got a 31 million years. So that very much puts it as part of the Bingham family that's younging down towards the south of the Pioche, which is, again, another historic CRD deposit. So Deer Trail very much sits on this um, CRD main, main street that's younging down to the um, south, basically a trend of giants. So that was a very exciting thing for us in 2019 to make that analogy, which no one else for 150 years has ever done before. And then I'm going to take you through this model. Um, this is a fairly generalised CRD model, but it works exceptionally well for deer trail. But then I'm going to show you in the next slide how we can actually apply this model in a lot more detail to deer trail and really focus in on it. But the thing to see here is that you've got basically the um, historic mine up here at number one, and that's where they've been mining for 150 years. They One day they make some money, and then the next year they'd lose it. And it was generally non-continuous mineralisation. It was high grade, but it just was... They could never really make a go of it. It wasn't until we got on site in 2020 and started drilling that we then found the postulated red wall limestone, which is at depth. You don't see it outcropping anywhere on the property or in that area, because it's all covered by this younger volcanic sequence, and it's undercover. But we postulated it was there, and then our first hole, we got down and we intersected that limestone straight away. So that's in that first um, couple of slides there where I showed you, we need limestone, we need room to grow. So this gives us the room to grow here. We know we tapped into it there. And some of our early holes started that we've released started to show that we're actually picking up mineralisation. And now, as we're vectoring into it and moving back towards underneath the mountain here, we're getting into this sort of area here where the mantos are getting larger, we're getting scarn mineralisation, the fluid's getting hotter, and that's taking us closer to this intrusive source, which we believe is actually a copper moly system. And this is very much a proven model. Um, Peter's discussed it a lot in the past for Santa Eulia and Taylor, Silvertip, Cinco de Mayo, and most importantly, Bingham, which is one of our neighbours up the road. But this is the model now applied to deer trail, and this is how we've advanced the model. Straight away, you can see there's a younger granitic intrusion that is part of the system. It's come in. Um, it's not really part of the mineralising, but it's there, and it gives us still plenty of mineralisation potential in this Mississippian um, red wall. We've still got six to 800 metres of mineralisation um, potential down there in depths. But what we've been dialing into is this back of this um, Carissa um, discovery that we announced last year. And that's really getting back into an area where the scarn mineralisation and the mantos are starting to get a lot thicker. And I'm going to take you through some of these results. And then the big difference here is that the, the source porphyry in the last model is much deeper. But we actually believe through geophysics and our surface mapping that there's a potential for it to be much higher up in the system. And I'm going to show you some of those results that we drilled last summer and show you how we started to get really close to it. And then in the past, just to recap, all the drilling's been up high in the sequence. So they're never really in the system. And it wasn't until we started to put these holes in um, with MAG that we got down into the Mississippian and now we're dialing ourselves back into the bigger part of the system. And the beautiful thing about this um, property is that we control 
MAG controls all the land package over the top. And that's quite unusual. Um, so we're able to attack it from two ends. We're able to attack it from the CRD end out in this area, but we're also, as I'm going to show you the results of our first couple of drill holes last summer, able to attack it from the porphyry end as well. So we've got a two-pronged attack, if you like, on this property, which is a pretty exciting and dynamic situation to be in. So this is a cross-section, a slice through the mountain. And what I want to show you here is this whole line that I've talked about before. This is coming down through here. And that's what had the 274 metres of um, CRD alteration and mineralisation. And that's unusual to see that sheer amount and thickness of that style of alteration leading into mineralisation. Um, that was a very exciting drill hole for us. And over that 274 metres, yeah, it's not a discovery, but it's getting us really close into the system. It's dialing us into the system. And over that 274 metres, you still had 12 grams of silver and 0.2% of copper and little sniffs of gold and lead zinc. But then as you got further down in the hole, you had the 26 metres at the bottom of the hole of um, up to 30 ppm of silver and 0.6% copper. We're definitely getting closer to the system. And that was a very exciting hole for us. And it's well off the historic mine trend. So it was a new discovery for us. And then we know on spot size, you've actually got, if you put into that sulphide lacing, and I'm gonna show you that and again a couple of slides now, you've got some high grade silver. You've got isolated spots of up to 200 ppm silver and up to a couple of percent copper on isolated spots. So you know the mineralization is down there. It exists at depth. And then what we're doing at the moment is following up on this. This was the hole here, um, hole nine. And then we drilled hole 16 and finished drilling that um, end of last year. And that was, again, using that gold that we talked about up high in the system, which can be the outer expression of the CRD mineralization. We're following it down there and using that to vector us in on the CRD mineralization. So this hole we're expecting we'll hit a few gold values and we know that it's probably going to come down into CRD mineralisation as well. We're still waiting batedly for assays. And what we're doing at the moment is hole 17. This hole's just drilled down through the Corville formation. We've picked up a bit of CRD mineralisation and now we're drilling down into um, a 300 metre step out from this hole 9. So we're looking for big things here. We're doing big step outs, we're being aggressive. We're looking for big deposits and that's what you've got to do, is do big step outs to do this. So this is what the 270 metres looks like. Um, that's 0.2% copper all the way down to the bottom of the hole. And that's running up to 12 grams of silver there. And then we know over the whole lot in this last 26 metres, you've got up to 30 ppm of silver and 0.6% um, copper. But isolated within that, you've got some much higher grades as well. So again, we're getting closer, we're dialing into the system. And um, the next, the hole 17 that we're drilling at the moment is really gonna follow up on this intersection. So from a texture point of view, geologists love looking at the textures. These are the patterns in the core. And you can see a certain amount of complexity going on there. There's a lot of interfingering. There's fluid coming in from multiple directions. The fluid is pulsing and it's happening over multiple times. So the more pulses generally relates to the bigger systems. It's actually breathing and pulsing and bringing that mineralization into more than one event. So that's the sign of you're on something big. And um, to see that complexity in our core is really exciting for us. And again, you've got spot measurements down here off these veins, running up to a couple hundred ppm silver and some pretty interesting copper values as well. So this is another slide looking down in plan view. We looked before in the cross section of a slice through it. Now we're looking down directly above. That's the hole nine here with the 274 metres. And this is the hole 16 that we finished at the end of last year. Um, it was really using some gold, historic gold values that we'd seen in the data to really focus that hole in. And now we're drilling hole 17 on a 300 metre step out to the south out here. And that's the one that's in progress. And basically, when we get success there, we can then sit up here at the upper Carissa and we can drill a whole range of holes and we could sit the drill there the whole summer if we wanted to and drill out a whole series of holes. But looking at this now, 
we want to start thinking about how we can apply these results to the property in general. So this is, in the blue here, the historic deer trail. This is where they were mining for 150 years or over the last 150 years. You've got some little historical mantos along here. Already now, we're finding that you can explore out on this and the system is much bigger by this new discoveries down here. We already know it's beginning to grow. And then you've got the deer trail mountain here, which I'm going to talk about shortly as well, of just how that all fits into the bigger system. Because we've got a property that's basically 10 kilometres wide by 10 kilometres long. So it's a big area that we're exploring and, and never really been put together before until MAG got it. So I'm going to make some analogies here. But basically, we're going to look at Bingham Canyon and make some analogies across to Deer Trail. And Bingham started out, people forget that it was actually a CRD deposit, and people were mining that for a long time before they even figured out how to extract the copper. And so they took 50 million tonnes out of this. And Deer Trail, we think, is just on one little part of these spokes that is leading us into this central hub. And we know in the next map that I'm going to show you, there's lots of mineralisation potential and historic prospects all around the Deer Trail area that is dialling us into these spokes. And what I actually think we've got two spokes, and these, um, or two hubs rather, these central hubs can represent the Porphyry Centre, which we're thinking is going to have, that's where the copper mineralisation is being sourced from. So I'm going to talk you through how we're dialling that in, using the stratigraphy, understanding the plumbing system, understanding the multi-stage high-grade mineralisation that we're seeing, and then being able to dial into this central hub area. Um, so very much mag-sized targets um, on the deck here, and that's what we're looking at. And each with these flanking um, CRD targets around it, you know, the historic deer trial can just be out here, but there's a lot of other prospects out here that can represent this other CRD mineralisation. So this is um, a look at... Uh, the, um, the central hub system. I said there's two of them. There's the Deer Trail hub system here, and then there's the one over um, Bingham Canyon Alunite hub system here. And as what we did last summer is we actually got a drill hole up there. They're the first two deep targeted drill holes that have been drilled on this property historically. So um, we learnt an incredible amount from those first two holes, and I'm going to show you those results. And um, Alunite itself is a hydrothermal expression. And when you have alunite, you always know there's a hydrothermal source underneath it driving it. And alunite, when you Google alunite, it takes you to alunite ridge, which is this ridge here. And we've got some of the thickest, biggest alunite veins in the Americas, if not in the world. And no one has actually ever drilled a targeted hole underneath it until we did last year. And I want to take you through those results and what that means and how we're vectoring in even further. And the same with deer trail. People have been postulating this is a porphyry hub, but to get a drill, get a drill rig up to 3,200 metres, get water up there and actually drill a 1,600 metre hole is logistically challenging, but we did it last year and we're still able to get that hole down and I want to show you those results. So this is the um, alunite ridge target. Again, the biggest alunite deposits um, in the Americas here and we got a hole underneath it. And down at 754 to 768 metres, we saw that alteration, mineralisation. And this is where we got up to 6 ppm gold over a spot and up to 562 um, silver, 1.1% copper, and got into some lead and zinc, as well as some other indicator minerals there. And so we can really start to see a proof of concept. There's fluid down deep. There's a theory... And it's playing out with actual mineralisation at depth in this system underneath Alunite Ridge. So we're going to vector in on that now more. Um, this is a, a photos under shortwave ultraviolet light. These are the veins, and these veins are fluorescing. It's mangano and calcite, which is excited by shortwave ultraviolet light. And what those veins are telling us is that they're going pretty much down the hole. We were drilling pretty much down the veins there, but they veer off to, to one side. The drill hole, unfortunately, went the other way because it's our first hole. We didn't have everything figured out in the orientations in the first hole. But what it shows is there's actually fluid down there, down deep, and this is a good sign to see under the shortwave ultraviolet light. It's very flashy uh, material. This is basically the exhaust of mineralisation at depth. So we know we're going down there. We've got a good proof of concept. The deer trail hole um, also was had in the top 300 metres 
we hit this gossness material. It's 30 metres and it's running up to 200 ppm copper and 0.2% zinc. That's not background. You know, that's coming from somewhere. And we've got a pretty good idea now of where it's coming from because we drill oriented cores so we know the angles of how things are moving. And then down deeper in the hole, at 138 metres down in the Moenkopi mudstone, which is generally an aquitard fluid, doesn't like flowing through a mudstone, you've got all this porophyllite um, alteration. This is this spotty material here. And that's also indicative of a hydrothermal source. So you're really getting proof of concepts that we got down close um, to this porphyry sources in both these areas. And from that and from this oriented core, we've got a pretty good idea of where that fluid's coming from. So that's what we're going to be really um, dialing into this summer is using those results to then target our holes in our summer exploration. So this is a nice um, picture that Peter found online. This is the deer trial. I see that as 6.10.22, so about 100 years ago. And this is in the upper deer trail, um, looking down. And this is very much how they were mining it, on small-scale, hobby-style mining almost. Very small, low-level scale. But we saw in that deer trail, that's way up high in the system. Yeah, it was high grade. One minute you made some money, and then, then you lost it for a while. And then you made a bit more, and then it never really made a go of it. But that's over 100 years ago now. And now, in that time, we've got the property-wide approach, and that's how we're dialing into it, going from this small-scale approach into a much bigger holistic approach where we can not only target the CRD mineralisation, but we can target the porphyry potential as well. So this year, we're going to be continuing with that hole that I talked about in the cross-section there. That's in progress at the moment. And continuing with that Carissa discovery and getting some more holes in and around it. Now... Drilling takes a while out there. The holes are up to, you know, 1,600 metres deep. They can take eight to ten weeks to drill. So good things do take time. And we only get about five holes in a year um, to actually get things done. Just with one drill, we're taking it slow. We're taking a scientific approach. We're not rushing in there. So this is why things are taking our time, because we're able to think for each drill hole and really focus in. And so we're going to follow up on this deer trail porphyry. We're going to go from CRD mineralisation to a porphyry target up on the deer trail mountain, focus in on that alteration that we saw in those slides that I showed you, and then also focus in on the alienite porphyry potential as well. Really focusing in, and we know the directions of um, some of those vein trends, and that's what we're going to aim the drill at this time. Because there's only really the second deep, hole, second deep hole in history up there. So still early days, but we're already making a lot of inroads. And then we'll probably do some more Carissa follow-up drilling as well. So I wanted to finish it there and just remind you we're on CRD Main Street. We've got Bingham up one end of the rainbow, one of the world's biggest copper porphyry systems going, which started out life as a CRD. And then we've got Pioche down in Nevada, which is a big historic CRD trend. And we've got Deer Trail. This is a historic upper Deer Trail in the middle here, which has basically been long overlooked for 150 years until... MAG got on the ground and started aggressively drilling it and attacking it from both ends of the system, from the CRD end and from the porphyry end. So I'll leave it there um, and hand off to Nate. Any questions while I'm standing here? Bring this down. I'm not as tall as Lex <laughs> or Pedro. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our First Nations communities, uh, Apatipi and Matachuan, uh, for being in attendance and appreciate your su continuing support. I'm here to give you guys uh, an update on the Larder Project. We're located in Larder Lake, Ontario. Um, here you can see an old historic. Uh, mine, it's called the Sheminus Mine, it goes down about 300 meters, uh, at multi-levels. They mined it in the 90s um, and sent the ore to the Karatis Mine just down the highway, which did uh, 10 million ounces at 12 grams, so pretty decent mine. Um, we're actively exploring at Larder right now. We have two rigs on the ground, um, both exploring along the Cadillac Larder Break, which I'll get into, and we're doing some pretty aggressive target generation uh, on the ground as well, so some geophysical surveys. Um, reassaying some core, a whole bunch of exciting things that are going to lead to the discovery for the team. 
So just a quick reminder of where we are in completing the MAG Triangle. Uh, Deer Trail's here, Juan Escipio, and we have Larder up here in Ontario. We are in a world-class district. This is an area in the Abitibi that has been known for many, many, many years. It's done over 200 million ounces of gold production in the history, and we have eight and a half kilometers of the Cadillac Larder Break. This is a first order structure. It's mineralized, which is atypical, but we're lucky in this case. We have eight and a half kilometers of it, um, and we've only tested about half of that. So we're looking to explore the other half um, through the campaign this year and leading into next year. There's mines all around us. About 20 minutes to the west is Mikasa and Kirkland Lake. I talked about Kratos and to the east, and the farther you go into Quebec, it's just nonstop. The Cadillac Louder Break, it, it does produce a lot of ounces. Um, the material in our ground is hosted in an ultramafic and iron tholeitic basalt. Those are the main hosts, um, and we typically get grades between you know, three grams all the way up to uh, 600 grams, one of the highest uh, grades on our property. So um, we've taken a few unconventional approaches at the project. We feel this project has had a lot of change of ownerships, and the approach of the exploration was the same. We had to change it up. So I'm going to go through a few things that we've done that have given us immediate success um, in leading into our potential discovery here in the near future. We're permitted. And we're drilling now, like I said, with two rigs. We have a lot of patents on the ground, which is really excellent. Um, you don't have to permit the patents. You can explore on them as you will. Um, and the rest of the project is essentially um, old larder legacy cell claims that are easy to permit with our excellent relations with the First Nations communities. Quick snapshot of our neighbor to the west, Agnico Eagle. And just to showcase again why this is so important. This is the Cadillac Larder Break. It runs through here. It goes all the way to the west past Kirkland Lake, and it goes all the way into Quebec for hundreds of kilometers. Um, but what's really interesting is that this second order structure and this third order structure, which I'll really try to make sure you guys understand this, these have not been explored on our property. These are the ones that have been overlooked. These are the not low-hanging fruit. All the easy stuff has been done. What we're going to do is we're going to go back, we're going to use unconventional approaches, and we're going to try and find the discoveries on these second order structures. There's lots of mines historically in the Abitibi that are on second order structures. We just have not had the chance to explore it until now. So this is something we're really excited to do here, probably in Q2. Quick snapshot of the Cadillac Larder Break, because we talk about it a lot. This is where we're situated right here. This is the old Sheminist mine I was speaking to. Here's Kerr Addison. Goes down to almost two kilometers. Um, and this, we highlight this. We call this the golden zone. Everything gets quite exciting below 500 meters. Our property has been heavily explored in the upper 500. And it's had really good success. But what we want to do now is showcase why and what is below that 500 meters. So we're doing a bit more deep drilling. We're doing unconventional approaches. And we want to try and mimic some of these big mines that have been produced on the Cadillac Larder Break. One of our new exploration techniques that we utilized on the property was a magnetotelluric survey. Essentially what this does is highlights lithostructural contrast. And for us, it actually really modeled the Sheminus mine trend from surface down to about 1,000 meters. So what we did is we decided to drill test this on a couple of areas where we saw some inflection points in the structure. And we were able to identify the mine sequence, which is essentially the host rocks in the, the actual Sheminus mine. And we had 3.2 3 grams over 11 meters, including 10.2 over 2 at the deepest spot that's been explored at Sheminus. This is new. This has never been done before. The Sheminus mine has only ever been explored down to around 400, 500 meters. We've extended it down past the golden zone into an area that we feel is where things can get really, really exciting. So this is big, this is big for the larger project. And right now, we have the second rig on the bear zone. The bear zone is our higher grade. It's not hosted in the typical South Volcanics floor that you see at Sheminus. It's hosted in more quartz-rich green carbonate comatiites, and the grades typically get higher at bare, and the zones are typically deeper. So the thesis is things get better below 500, and we're exploring that aggressively now. So why larder? It's always the question we get. And we've done a lot of work to be able to approach things quantitatively now. We have eight and a half kilometers. Only 30% of it's been explored on the east side of the break. The west side, which we call Swansea, which I'll talk to in a second, has not been explored nearly as enough. To put it into context, on the east side, where we have three main zones, Fernland, Sheminus, and Bear, has had about 300,000 meters of drilling done. On the Swansea side, 25,000. 
a significant underexplored area that we're about to explore aggressively here, um, utilizing some of our new techniques. We have 20 kilometers of untested second and third order structures on our property, completely untested. We will be exploring our second order structure on a trachyte sediment contact, which is similar to what you see uh, at Agnico's Upper Canada Mine. So we're going to be testing this in Q2 this year. It's really exciting because it's true exploration. The low-hanging fruit's already all been done, so we're, we're pretty excited to go into somewhere new. There's also not just orogenic style gold mineralization in the property. We have conglomerate hosted, Tamiskaming conglomerates up in the northern part of our property, and we have intrusion related mineralization that we're seeing as well around the properties. This is all just based off of surface sampling. So these are all target generational um, exploration techniques that we're using that are gonna drive our drill campaign. Um, and last year we did some significant uh, target generations. We did downhole IP, televiewer, Magnetotolerics, we did a lot of stuff that have led to a target rich inventory that we're going to drill off this year. This is a good image to show you our property boundary. It's a plan map, so you're looking down at the property. Um, and what you see here is the geological trend of our Cadillac Larder Break. It's miscoming in age. Um, and what you see here is the purple is our ultramafic, so chromatiatic, a green carbonate hosted gold zones, and then iron rich tholeites. Historically, at the Caradison mine, just down the highway here, they mined the entire thing essentially in uh, what they call flow ore. It's an iron-rich, pyrite-rich volcanic unit. That's what we have at Fernine and Sheminus. And at the bear zone, we have the green carbonate ore. So these are the three main zones that we are our highest advanced target. At the Swansea side, it's covered by a swamp. It's very challenging to drill. We did drill it pretty much after this meeting last year, and we had some recent success. Um, that's leading us to a new technique that we feel that might be able to help us get a, a new discovery at Swansea. So just want to highlight the second order structure. It runs eight and a half kilometers, just like we have on the Cadillac Loader Break. And our third order structure that runs through our advanced uh, curvet asset. The curvet asset is a conglomerate hosted, cyanide hosted, intrusion related, completely different than what you see on the first order structure. So the, the property just has, is just primed for a discovery. Everything's been easily done down here, so we're moving things forward and we're trying to explore uh, and find that new discovery. So what did we do last year? We had some pretty high goals, um, and I feel like we had some really good successes and some really good results to prove it. We were able to trace the Sheminus mine trend down to 1.7 kilometers. It's very deep. It's too deep right now, but we, we traced it down. We thought that that was an aggressive approach, to be honest. And what we did is we went back to the drawing board and we said, let's start from the top and work our way down. Let's really understand this thing. And in doing so, we were able to identify that mine trend down to 700 meters and having gold grades up to 10 grams. So that was very successful. Then we moved over to Bear. You can see here, the Bear Zone. And we decided to go into the eastern part of it. The western part has been very, has identified very well. The east has not been explored. We are able to trace mineralization from surface down to 600 meters below that golden zone. And right now we're actively exploring using directional drilling, um, the bear zone. So what you can see here is we've really developed out these two areas. There's a lot of drilling here, but we've extended all the zones at depth. Last year, we just decided to explore Swansea just a little bit. And in doing so, we identified a brand new zone that was historically mapped as sediments, which are not typically gold bearing on our property. Um, and an ultra altered uh, green carbonate zone. That is what is hosted in all of our zones over here. So we had to decide what do we do next? And what we did is we took a break and we're doing an overburdened drilling program right now at the Swansea zone. Why are we doing that? We're doing that because it's covered in a swamp. We can't typically understand what the surface geology is. And this has been mapped for since 1941 as sediments. We drilled off this area of green carbonate alteration that is typically known to host gold in the region and it blew our minds that we had this new alteration zone. So we had to go back to the drawing board and it led to the overburden drilling. So we were hoping, actually we're seeing immediate results that there are um, samples that are ultramafic coming from the overburden drilling. So we're seeing already that the geological surface expression is changing. This is huge for Swansea because right now it's very difficult to drill it because of the swamp. So after we tested the anomalies in uh, late 2023, 
We confirmed the geophysical survey worked. We confirmed that chargeability was successful in identifying the iron formations and the pyrite concentration. Now we're going back and we're going to define the surface. That will lead to the next round of drilling at Swansea. This is good success. This is the right path. This is the right thinking. It's critical thinking for Swansea. We don't want to just drill it. We want to be smart with our drilling and smart with the money we spend. So this is the approach we decided to take. This was hard for me. This is, we call this the Geology Property Project, GPP. You might hear us talk about it here and there. It's the first time I've ever done it. We took a break of, in drilling. Not the project kept going, but it was really hard to, as a geo and exploration guy, to stop drilling. It was, it was but we did it. <laughs> and it was one of the most compelling and like enlightening things I've ever done in my career. We took all the data on the property. The property has been explored for almost 100 years. It's very old. Um, and we put it together and we synthesized it all. The, the project needed that. Like I said, it's been done the same over and over and over. We had to take a different approach. So what we did is we stopped drilling and we took all the old core, went through every picture, took photographs again, re-logged it, reinterpreted it, and so many successful little things came out of this. This is now what drives larder, the GPP. This is very important, and it gives us the new big picture interpretation that we never had before. We never understood the second order structure. We never understood the Cadillac break. We never really knew what was in between the shear zones. Is there on echelon structures? It's extensional. This has given us the flexibility and the understanding on how to approach the programs moving forward in a very quantitative way. And this has been absolutely outstanding for the project. So many things have been successful leading it after this. This happened literally right after this meeting. We stopped. And we've been using the GPP moving forward every day. And lots of little projects are falling into it now. And what did that lead to? That led to the Sheminus discovery at 700 meters down. What you're looking at here is a cross section looking east. Here's the old Sheminus mine here, down to 300 meters, the workings. This is the south side of the Cadillac breaks, so you're looking east. Here is the north side. This is the south flow that they typically mined at the Kerr Addison. And everything was really developed nicely up here. We took the magnetotelluric survey that modeled the south zone for us really well. We found a knuckle, a little flexure in the structure. We decided to test it. And this all came from the GPP. The GPP gave us a new lithostructural model, a geophysical model, orienting core, um, you name it. All these things have led into this type of success. And this is the way we're approaching everything at Larder now. It's, 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 a, it's a game changer for the project, for sure. And not just at Sheminus, extending this zone down. And these are all brand new numbers. This all happened last year. We were able to extend Bear down to 650 meters with uh, 16 grams over 1.4, including a 33 gram hit. These are all immediate successes from the GPP. So this is really important to understand that we're not just drilling to drill. We're not just doing infill. These are very thoughtful drill holes now. And they're based off of the models that we've built. So what's next at Larder? Like, the low-hanging fruit, I find the Cadillac Larder break is kind of easy to drill. You know it's there. So wh where are we going next? So having the success that we did with the geophysical survey down here on the main break, we call this CLB East, and, this, and the way it's been able to help us model these zones really well and the structural contrast and the folds and faults, we decided to go property-wide with it. It's working. Why not do the whole property? So right now, we're running this survey um, up at site. Uh, we just finished the eastern side of the property. So the western side will be done here probably in a month. Interpretation will take a bit. This will generate the targets for Swansea. This will generate targets for the second order structures, which is where we hope to find something new. This will help develop a curve it. This type of exploration is what the project has never had and will have moving forward, and including um, we've upgraded our LIDAR and magnetics using a drone survey. Super detailed, down to 10 meters on the LIDAR, and the magnetics 10 meters as well. And the actual ortho photo that came from it's down to um, 10 centimeters. So extremely detailed LIDAR magnetics in junction with all of our geophysical surveys. It's going to be an exciting drill season here for the next uh, year and a half. And where is the discovery going to come from? Our best bet right now is our second order structure. We feel that this is the most, the top untested regional target on the property. It, 
This is the MT survey that you're looking at here. So what you're seeing is a resistivities. So a resistivity high, a resistivity low. And it also maps structural trends. And what we've noticed here, so this is an image looking east. This is the plan view of the property. So here you have Sheminus the mine, Fernland, and Bear. And this is where we're planning to drill here, here, and here. Fortunate too, our patents come all the way up here so we don't have to permit it, so that's exciting. We see folds and faults within these two different, uh, the sediments and the trachytes. Here's the Sheminus mine. This is, this is a structural trap I've ever seen one before in my life. And it is beautiful. You can see it here imaged on the, uh, the surface mapping. These, this is the type of stuff that we're really excited to drill. So this is where we're moving forward at Larder. We're going to always drill the Cadillac Larder break. We're not going to walk away from it. It's easy to add ounces there. It's easy to help adding gold value on the property. But this is the needle mover. This is the type of stuff that we're excited to do. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to start drilling this out here pretty soon. I wanted just to show you uh, kind of inside the mind of Larder and where our concepts interpretation come from. I'm hoping that this will be a different slide next year, so that'd be exciting. But what we see, this is so what you're looking at are two plan views. So you're looking down at both. This is all the drilling. These are assays above five grams. And this is the modeled Cadillac Larder break that we pulled from re, during the GPP, the relogging of shear zones. Um, we had a structural geologist come in and we actually modeled it all out. And you can see right here, we call this the twist. And Sheminus sits right in this beautiful flexure. Beautiful. It's a perfect little dilation spot. The mine's there. Some of the best grades in the property sit right here. And if you come across the Cadillac break, everything's south dipping at Sheminus and Fernland. It switches. And everything starts to north dip here. This is a really exciting underexplored area that looks exactly like this with very minimal drilling in it. So this is the type of stuff that we'll start exploring on the CLB. Instead of just drilling deep and the low-hanging fruit and extending zones, finding something new. This is what the project needs. So what's planned for this year? Seek the discovery for George. We'll get it for you. <laughs> so one drill, we'll be running around testing these second-order structures, testing all of our concepts and ideas. We'll always have one rig probably down on the break because we find that this is an easy spot to add uh, ounces. Um, and moving forward, we're always going to be doing target generation. Yes, we're doing the property-wide survey, but there's still more to do. There's different techniques out there. There's lots of ideas and concepts floating around, so we, we hope to continue adding to the inventory, as well as hopefully finding a discovery and adding ounces on the break. George? Right. Thanks, Good job, mate. Thanks. I love following Nathan as a presenter because I don't have to change the microphone. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, I don't know about you people, but I'm pretty excited. They were two bang up presentations, fellas. Thank you. Forward looking statement, it's only a matter of time. And in fact, if you look at the data that both Lex and Nate showed you, there are metres of intercept there at very high grades that you would see in press releases from a lot of people. We don't, we don't press release that. We press release when we have a geological story to tell that leads to a geological model that leads to a PEA that leads to a mine. Only a matter of time. So to wrap up here, you can see in the top line here we had free cash flow coming in in Q4 of last year. We actually bought it home, first one in Q3 of last year. Q4 will be released on the 19th, yep, 19th of March, and um, let's see what happens then. You can see our Q4 production in our previous release, production only was very strong. So um, metal prices where they are. Uh, we hope to continue to build our cash position. Exploration at one, the CPO remains potentially the greatest needle mover we have because we've got a mine built there, running well. And as Peter said, we're still at that 5% of the property export. So lots of potential there. We're going to let the analysts get some updated numbers soon with the release of the uh, technical report uh, end of the end of, end of the year end of uh, this month and uh, we hope that resets things pretty well the current uh, nice technical report backed up by you know a few quarters of operating data now and you know three years of mining the underground uh, resource I don't need to talk about deer trail and uh, larder again only a matter of time so thank you everyone